Good morning, everyone. It's December 31st, 2021. It's This Week in XR. I'm here with Ted Shilowitz to knock around the news. We don't have a guest, or I should say, I am a guest on my own show because today is my birthday. Happy birthday and happy new year. It's an auspicious day for you, Charlie. Yeah, 62, 62 times around the sun. 62 um, going on 20. <laughs> yep. This time, uh, this time 62 years ago, my mother was uh, relieved and having a smoke in her in her uh, hospital room uh, at New York Hospital. So I love that. Have a, having a lucky strike in the hospital with <laughs> under the doctor's orders. <laughs> You know, mom's in 1959. I mean, I'm exactly maybe she was having a martini too. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> so, we decided to meet today because it was kind of a newsworthy uh two weeks since our yeah. uh podcast. So, we thought we would uh take a little time this morning to talk about it and uh and bring you up to speed on the news. So it's beginning to look a lot like Questmas. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like that, Charlie. That's good. And, and uh, apparently the, the metaverse train in 2022 just keeps on rolling right along. Lots of uh, investments, lots of chewing on this on this thing that you know everybody is starting to get uh, what people like us and others that you know sort of track things a little ahead of time have realized has been coming for the last effectively 10 years and sort of developing underneath the covers. I was talking to some friends uh, the other day about this phenomenon and um, the the underbelly of how to evolve the web experience and how ubiquitous the web has been isn't just a flash in the pan, didn't just happen in the last six months and then suddenly, you know, we we found a name for it. We were able to you know, abscond Neil's sort of concept. Well, right, you and I have been concept. talking about the metaverse for the past 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. When Facebook seven years ago acquired Oculus, uh, Zuckerberg was talking about the metaverse then. I, I think it was the confluence of mentions and mm -hmm. the portentousness of the name change that mm -hmm. really got people's attention. I mean, right. I it became the mainstream Epic, moment. Epic yeah. had made an announcement. Nvidia had made an announcement. Yeah. You know, so this metaverse thing, right? Venture Beat had a metaverse conference way back in February of twenty twenty one. So, uh, you know, this was kind of in the air and. Um, interesting how this web three notion and how decentralized finance and the metaverse have kind of glommed onto one another right 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 yeah the uh the and and you know how it all relates to this terminology nft which is one layer below maybe the popularity of the term metaverse right now but for those that are really tracking it and finding a new dynamic of commerce uh as it relates to blockchain and you know items that don't exist in the real world, but only exist as a digital construct. Right, your uh, digital assets, your wallet, your costumes, whatever else, whatever else you want to have with you as you effectively search or teleport around Correct. Um, the metaverse, which is, you know, a metaphor for hyperlinks. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's, you know, we are well on our way to evolving this notion. Uh, it doesn't really exist yet. I put a bunch of links to, it's funny because, you know, when, whenever there's a, a kind of bubble-like rush uh, to something new, there are always a series of debunking articles. I remember yes, them well from 2015 and 2016, which were of the VR is not all well, that variety. And now we've got a spate of articles from the New York Times and the Washington Post, both stating the obvious which is that the metaverse doesn't exist yet, mm -hmm. or that the American metaverse, or let's say the metaverse we see uh, in the West is very different than the metaverse that is gonna be seen in Asia and Africa and Russia and around the world. So we're not gonna have a little, literal metaverse until we uh, can resolve issues around physical borders. Right. And uh, you know, our friend Matthew Ball uh, in, in one of his blog posts put up a, a piece of an article he found from, 25 years ago in like the London Times or something talking about the fact that this internet thing is a total fad and no one needs the internet and it's not going to be anything. And my, you know, well, apparently it's somewhat of a contrarian view. I don't think it's really a contrarian view that I have this belief structure that the minute we found connective tissue with technology, the metaverse existed. You know, it's it exists all the way back to the beginnings of cinema and the beginnings of television and the beginnings of radio. And all we've been doing is evolving our communication tools and our sophistication of how we use audiovisual systems 
and we're doing it right now. We're just using a, a very low cost, essentially free tool to be in this part of the metaverse. And people that are listening to this on a podcast are listening to that in their part of the metaverse. So the fact that people somehow have a perception that's all new is completely wrong to me. It's yeah. just the next step in how we evolve, how we use the, 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 the way that we connect ourselves, right? So well, it you, seems like a know, bunch of people know how nothing and everything. You know how a newsroom works. Yeah, right? I know. The editor looks at the young, hip guy, and right. he says, what's up with the metaverse? <laughs> and I said, well, I'll, I'll write the story. Right, right and, right. and of course, you know, and then the editor says, well, if you ask my opinion, I think it's a bunch of marketing. A bunch of hooey, right, right. And so now this 28-year-old J school graduate has 24 hours to become a fucking expert in the metaverse mm -hmm. and send it to mm -hmm. his skeptical mm -hmm. editor to see if he right. can get a byline in the post this week. Right. So it's it's just for those of you who wonder, I wouldn't call the process corrupt. I would call it a process that is the result of humans. Yeah. And I guess this process has been happening over and over again. Step of the equation. From as as Matthew brought evidence forth, it's just happening all over again. Which right. of it's course just another version of the printing press, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's history repeats itself over and over. So, exactly. you know, and it feels a lot like the late 90s. Yeah, so, it does. It feels like the bubble is blow it well. And that's maybe the where difference I was is going, my friend. That's exactly the bubble where is, I was is going, going is blowing up really, really fast and getting ready to pop really, really big, right? Even bigger than the last one, maybe, because when you blow it up quicker, it has a chance to pop faster. So get ready. Yeah. So and by the way, that didn't mean that the internet didn't happen. It just meant that exactly. people who who were too aggressive too early were gonna have to sit down and wait for 10 years. Yep. 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 Um, but, you know, all those stocks that took a big hammering, maybe with the exception of Yahoo uh, and AOL, have come roaring back. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, wish I had bought some of that Oracle stock in 2000. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> right. So when that was when Oracle was going to go toe to toe with Microsoft. Right. right. Those of you who forget. Um, are all always winners and losers. losers. We're going down old Zhang old Lang Syne here. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you remember, but in 1996, Microsoft loaned Apple $400 million. Of course because, I remember. Because Apple was crashing. And if Apple went down, Microsoft would have no argument that it did not have a, mo a monopoly. Right. I was I was deep in the Apple system, Apple ecosystem. I was there at all those keynotes during that period of time and all those Mac worlds and, and you know, was doing a lot of work directly with Apple at that time. And and some of you know that sort of know my career, my my world has been completely tied to Apple um, in terms of startups that I've been able to work on and, and help you know bring to life. And so I've been into that ecosystem and I remember every last bit of that uh, as if it were yesterday. And, you know, also uh, would have been a good time to buy Apple stock. <laughs> Uh, certainly would have. <laughs> so, so we've got a couple of other uh, funding announcements. Speaking of bubbles, yeah. So we've got Rec Room nabbing another hundred and thirty-five billion dollars uh, at an eye-popping three point five billion dollar valuation. Uh, you know, their audience is mostly, uh, you know, fourteen to twenty-two year olds. Um, you know, they don't have anywhere near uh, of of you know, sales the way, let's say Fortnite has. Right. Um, so it's really a, got a nascent economics behind oh. it. But I guess people are seeing the makings of another Roblox. Exactly. That's what I was going to say is it, it feels like that level of investment and that level of valuation, there's only one logical conclusion that an investor would make is where is the next Roblox? And is this VR thing going to really take off? And is this Rec Room thing actually going to move to a cross-platform universe? But let's be clear, Rec Room has exploded in the past 18 months because they blew off VR. Right. Right. They the, All their traffic is coming from mobile platforms, platforms and game consoles. Correct. And, and VR for them, it's a little bit like the Spatial Story or, mm -hmm. um, you know, Happy Giant or any of these companies that, uh, you know, I wrote about uh, the company formerly called Little Star, which was a... 360 video distributor, which has pivoted to become an NFT broker and creator. Yep. So just like Spatial, they're just, they're not saying this is never going to work, but they're saying I raised a lot of money and I need to make some dough. And, mm -hmm. and here's an obvious path to do so. It's not totally unrelated, but it is. 
But nevertheless, uh, you know, they go to their board of directors and say, okay, well, here's what we've discovered. It's going to take three to five years to develop this category. But there is an alternative that might develop in the next 24 months. What do you think we should do? Right. It's like, you know, there's a build the bone strategy, which you can kind of create an analog to the automotive industry, right? There are autom- a lot of large automotive manufacturers build very exotic sports cars for a very, very small part of the market, right? But they learn from that and they use that tool set to build the cars for everybody. Um, and, and it's aspirational. And you look like a cooler company because you have a super exotic sports car or, or few in your lineup, but that's not where you make your dough. And what's really happening with our business is VR still is the sexy sports car. Now it's starting to become a Toyota Camry, but it's not quite there yet. Um, but these smart companies have realized that this is how you can find scale and you can find a dynamic to keep your company alive and thriving. And a few of them, like Rec Room, as, you, as we've talked about, have proven it to a plum, to extraordinary success in the market. So, you know, good on them to realize that it's a, it's a multi-platform, cross-platform world, not a VR-only world, right? It, so you it, get excited. It, it and then feels to me like 2021, 2022 is going to see a bunch of big tech IPOs. This might be one of them. Um, I, I don't think we'll see SpaceX or uh, Epic <laughs> Games in 22, but those are yeah. clearly, yeah, Teddy wants to go out. Yeah, Teddy, your Teddy wants to go out. My like Teddy that. wants to go out. By the way, people, I did not name this dog after Shilowitz. No, uh, definitely not. I picked it out. Um, it is um, when you do the Teddy, you know, it's more, yeah. more. And everybody that knows me from when I was below the age of 16 still calls me Teddy. So. Oh, God. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel any better, they used to call me Chucky. Yeah, there you go. You know, which really <laughs> rhymes with some great things. Yeah, until uh, the doll came out and everything was like, you can't be called that anymore. <laughs> so, so some interesting news. Have you ever heard of this company called Space Metaverse? Yes, in fact, um, it is It is one of the, okay, so. They raised $7 you know, million dollars is why I bring it up. Yeah, 7 million bucks. And, you know, there's, this is kind of in the, in the zone of um, Decentraland and all things like Decentraland, right? Or maybe we go back to, we had, you know, Philip Rosedale on a few weeks ago on the podcast, Second yeah. Life and all things related to what Second Life is, different applications, different versions of it. So Space Metaverse is one. There's another one called Superworld. Um, I actually have a plot in Superworld, interestingly enough, that was gifted to me. Um, And, you know, there's a bunch of these things that are like these layers on top of real real estate using kind of mapping and geolocation to say this is your sort of ownership stake in the metaverse of virtual land. This is just one of them. But it's an interestingly good implementation of it. Um, This is another one of these open questions of, you know, who's going to win, who's going to lose and who's going to fall off the radar with so much duplication in this in this area of virtual land, virtual real estate, NFT real estate. Um, I'm I'm not quite sure the virtual land thing is going to work, to be honest. Uh, We we shall see. But I, I, I think that Facebook or I should say Meta has a much better shot with that because they're going to tie it to your virtual home and your virtual um, spawn point in the metaverse. Uh, So that gives them an extraordinary advantage. It's it's what the desktop was to Microsoft uh, in the 90s. Right, it's just another construct, right? I mean, the fact that everybody has a website and we sort of visualize that as, oh, they have a website wherever they are in the world. If you happen to have a company in Amsterdam, your website is, you think it's like in Amsterdam, but actually it's being hosted in Iceland or something like that, right? So it's just yeah. another- I just, If I was going to make a bet on this DeFi thing, I'm not sure I would tie it to virtual land, but my God, the amount of money goes going into it shows that there are some people who have real confidence that it will. Yeah. And these are not dumb people. Right. So, so um, well, we, we're almost out of time, Ted. There is one- Wow, story already. Story. That's amazing. <laughs> it's, there, there is one story I wanted, two stories really. One is- what's going to happen at CES next week. And the other one is I want to talk about the haptic gloves. Yeah. $299 for the low cost haptic gloves, right? Finally. That was why I was going, but I thought that one thing doesn't justify the risk. Right, right, right. And it is, it is a risk reward phenomenon now. Um, I mean, we've been tracking the news, obviously very closely, anybody that's working in our industry of, you know, a, a shell of its former self, but I think there will still be valid reasons to go. And it may actually be, the most interesting CES for young startups to actually break through the noise and as the large companies sort of drop out and say it's not safe. But the problem is everybody in the press has pulled out. Right. 
So ultimately, it becomes a metaverse conference, right? It becomes yet another digital construct of something yeah. we used to do in the real world. Uh, I really miss CES. You know, it would have been my 28th CES. Here I am. I've been trying since 2020 to get to 30. But I, I don't know if it's going to happen. <laughs> it might not happen. It might only happen in the in the digital world. Anyway, congrats to Be Haptics and everybody bringing uh, new tech and new hardware to CES this year. I'm really sorry it worked out this way. Not sorrier than the city of Las Vegas or CES itself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those are the risks you take in the new normal. Um, so, you know, CES is not poor. They got plenty of money for putting on their show, although it will be a sad and forgettable one. And yeah. hopefully we'll be together um, in the real uh, again soon, because that was pretty great being together at AWE. And I was looking forward to another great experience getting back together with people in the real at CES. So I think there are going to be a lot of people who are at CES who are going to spend most of their time in their hotel room or their suite. Yeah, it's just a, it's a, it doesn't, that you, when you lose the social fabric, well, look, if, if these big tech companies are right, and we're right by doing this podcast and, and reporting on these things week after week, is that the usefulness of the real social fabric is extraordinarily valuable, but it's not the only way to do it. We can do it without the physical existence and the physical contact, and we're a little nervous about that, but we're also a little optimistic about that. Well, right? we, we obviously are getting used to it. Yeah. You know, there's no Zoom shock, so right. Right. right? There's no like, I don't know what it, this is going to be like, um, you know. But I, I will say the things that happen to you in real life, you know, stick on your brain much better than a Zoom call or a podcast does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and the and the prediction about the usefulness and the evolution of virtual reality and mixed reality is that spatial sense. Right. And you and I have done spatial meetings inside things like spatial and horizons and so forth and so on. And of course, it's not the same as the real world, but it's definitely not the same as a flat two dimension. Right. It's, it's, yeah. I think it's a very necessary and useful variation. Yeah. On it. I, I think that, you know, again, I think we are moving toward these hybridized uh, conferences, hybridized work environments. I mean, this is the new normal. Yeah. And, and I don't think the, uh, the current spike uh, in COVID. Uh, I think from now on, we're going to be expecting a spike at any minute, and we're just going to have to live our lives knowing that, you know, there is this, we're, we're cohabiting the world with this virus, uh, and we, we need to take great care. Uh, and I think you're going to see mask wearing extended by this. I, I think, you know, no one is going to feel completely safe for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, I think this really took the air out of uh, some momentum toward normalcy. Uh, where, again, it's a hybrid world. We have our mask on sometimes, but other times not. Uh, you know, that, that all of that, you know, <laughs> pleasing progress uh, has uh, sent us back to uh, essentially not having New Year's Eve with anybody. Yeah. Um, it's funny, you know, the reason I, the thing that broke the camel's back for me at CES uh, was you and I were talking about doing our annual dinner again. Right. And you said... I think I'm just going to go back to my hotel room. Yeah, it's it's and a I thought, well, social problem. Yeah, that's yeah. what everyone is going to do. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then what's the reason to be there, right? It's it's becomes, a... yeah, and it's funny because some of those people who, you know, because most of the really cool stuff is in suites, not on the yeah. floor, yeah, right, because they don't want the irrelevant people looking at their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and um, even those guys are, are like, oh, you're not here in person. Well, let's do Zoom. So they're going to spend the entire CES doing Zoom, possibly with somebody in the same hotel. <laughs> yeah, if they even go at all. Right. Exactly. It's just, yeah. 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 All right, Ted. Well, it was gr a great year of doing podcasts with you. It was very fun. I look forward to 2022 and all that comes with it, whatever, you know, strange Thank new you. worlds we have to navigate together, but at least we have a smile on our face. And, uh, you know, if you think about where we are in our lives and our careers, I, I, I really struggle, not for us, but for the young folks, for the folks that are in their 20s and 30s, marching through the, their, their career and not having the ability to go to a CES and have those meetings and, and be inspired. And the fact that, we're we're stuck in these bubbles of technology which is great it's how we've all made our living but you know as mom used to say remember to get out and play and now yeah, it's like, i think that, remember to get well, out and play you know, safely right how do you do that to me in my career the the key to mentorship has always been indirect 
and it's always been based on proximity and observation right. and Q and A. And right. without being able to do those things casually, without being able to grab a senior person by the water cooler, so to speak, and sort of debrief, like what did he mean when he said I was interested in this conversation? You know, mm -hmm. all of those things are impossible. Yeah, the nuances are get really you know, hard. And, and I think for young people trying to advance and trying to learn the subtleties of something as complex as the entertainment industry uh, really miss out uh, yeah. by, by not getting that. I'm not saying they won't succeed and I'm not saying, I'm just saying the new normal and sucks in a lot of ways. But as agents of change, Charlie, we have to basically put, put a happy face on this and realize the benefits and understand the downside. Way, we have to find a way to use new technology to accomplish that old thing. Correct, correct. And we're largely doing it. I mean, you know, people are doing it and companies are thriving because of it. So here we go. They have Welcome to 2022. They have to. Have a great New Year's Eve, everybody. Enjoy Thank the New Year's. Ted, I'll see you in 2022. See you next year. Yeah. <laughs>